Welcome to this collaborative Baha for worship service. Whenever you are joining us, wherever you are joining us from, you are welcome to bring your whole self here and now. The Baha Four is an emerging collaboration of Unitarian Universalists across Southern Arizona. We represent Unitarian Universalists in and around Amado, Sierra Vista, and across the city of Tucson. While we have membership at four Unitarian Universalist institutions, we have been worshiping together for over a year now because we know that we are stronger together. Each week, it is our practice to have a land acknowledgement at the beginning of our worship services, recognizing the indigenous peoples who have lived on and been given treaty to the land that many of us now live on. Last week, our ministerial intern Riley asked us to consider how praxis, this cycle of acting, reflecting, and reacting, can help us grow and change as people and as Unitarian Universalists. In a moment, I will read one version of our land acknowledgement, and I'm going to ask you to listen for a word or phrase that sparks an interest in your own learning and growth. I encourage you to carry this word or phrase with you into your week, into your month, to support and encourage your own learning about your indigeneity or your colonizing behaviors and thoughts. Take a listen. We acknowledge that this land was stolen from indigenous peoples. In what is now called Southern Arizona, the displacement Genocide and theft of land occurred in successive waves of colonization by Spain, Mexico, and the United States. This colonization is still happening. The Chiricahua Apache, Pasquayaki, Otham, and Opata peoples are among the indigenous ancestors of this land and some have been given treaty to this land through forced removal at other locations. All are our neighbors today. May we learn to follow indigenous wisdom as we work to steward this earth, our common home. I light our chalice, the symbol of our shared Unitarian Universalist faith, with these words by David Rankin. Dear God, Good Friday is gone, a dark day on the calendar, a time of suffering with more losses than gains and more pain than we thought we could bear. We are tired of crying. We are tired of burying. We are tired of mourning. But Easter is here. And we who survived are prepared for the turning of the year, not to escape the past, but to provide a witness for a brighter future. We are ready for joy. We are ready for love. We are ready for new beginnings.
Happy Easter! Where do we start the Easter story? For us, it is with the fact that Jesus was a wise and radical teacher. Wait, no, not that kind of teacher. This teacher, he had a group of loyal and loving followers. His teachings were about love and kindness. Then he was put to death, executed by his government for his religious ideas. And that was the sad part. After he died, he was put in a tomb, and his followers were grief-stricken. However, that day was the Sabbath, the day of rest, so they couldn't attend to him until the next day. And then, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus. And very early on, on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, There is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee, and there you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone, so they were afraid. And all that had been commanded to them they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterward, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Now, as those of us familiar with the Bible might have guessed, there is much controversy in how the story ends. Some authorities say it should end here. Others add a longer ending of Mark. Though it is known as early as the late 2nd century Common Era, the longer ending is missing from the earliest, most reliable Greek manuscripts and seems to mix motifs and phrases from the other Gospels. One can wonder whether this longer ending is really Mark or even a ghostwriter. But here it is. Let's listen to it. Now, after he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went out and told those who had been with him while they were mourning and weeping. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. After this, he appeared in another form to two of them as they were walking into the country. And they went back and told the rest, but they did not believe them. Later, he appeared to the leaven themselves as they were sitting at the table, and he upbraided them for their lack of faith and stubbornness because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And he said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. And to the one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes in their hands, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. So then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and proclaimed the good news everywhere, while the Lord worked with them and confirmed the message by the signs that had accompanied it. In the bulb there is a flower, in the seed an apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise, butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter, there's a spring that waits to be. Unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. There's a song in every silence, seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness, bringing hope 
to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds a mystery. Unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. In our end is our beginning, in our time infinity. In our doubt there is believing, in our life eternity. In our death the resurrection, at the last a victory. Unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. El baton es flor mañana, la semilla manzana. El capullo es promesa, mariposa en libertad. El invierno es primavera, en espera de nacer. Incubierta hasta su tiempo, solo Dios la puede ver. In the beginning, once upon a time, a long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. In each of these beginnings, there is an invitation to find ourselves within mythology. From biblical creation stories to fairy tales to Star Wars on the big and little screen, mythology is a call to us beyond the literal, historical, and factual, to engage our moral imagination here and now. now. These myths and others have aided me throughout my life to witness the goodness of creation, to trust that there is a path home when I'm feeling alone and lost in life's woods, and to find new hope and resistance in the face of a tyrannical empire. Myths have called to me to see our world anew and offered me renewed ways to be a part of it and to take action. And it is my experience that this most often happens by accident. That is, despite the guidance that myths always offer, well, I don't walk around referencing them. I, I don't walk around ready to ask, um, what would Luke Skywalker do when a moment of moral discernment arises? All too often, it's me stumbling over a new challenge and then falling into a myth that has been there all along. And the Easter story, well, that's the same kind of myth. The story that Jamili shared has been a favorite of mine among many stories about Easter for as long as I can remember. Each Easter, this version has come alive in my imagination. The imagery of three women, each who knew and loved Jesus, rising early, going about the usual funeral rites, all while mourning his unjust death on the cross, and all simply because he challenged people to love their enemies. It's vivid for me on Easter mornings. And instead of death at his tomb, they find a messenger and are questioned, why do you seek the living among the dead? The Reverend John Thomas Cresswell, Jr., captures the meaning of this myth that's always been there for me in these words. Love is the message of these myths, 
and love emerges as the permanent in this transient world. You see, Easter is not just a story about one man dying, he teaches. Because he loved the people so much. Rather, it is the message to the person in the mirror, asking them to love more, care more, and give even more. Somehow, this Easter, after this long and traumatic year, I find myself stumbling, tripping, over the many and ongoing challenges that it has brought, and I find myself falling into Easter anew. Not that the familiar and beloved meaning has changed, but that I find myself perceiving the story from a different angle, and in the mythological mirror, I find a different message. And Joseph Campbell, a Western scholar of world mythology, noted several functions of mythology, but it was the last that he prescribed as the most useful for us today. This is the one, he said, that I think everyone must try today to relate to, and that is the pedagogical function of how to live a human lifetime under any circumstance. Easter is reflecting back to me how to live, to be born, to learn and to forget, to play and to be bored, to love and hate, to suffer and heal, and yes, to die, not just under any circumstances, but those that we face today. Like not being close to those that we love like the loss of the normal of every day, like the mourning that we experience, that we have no forms to pour it into. This year, Easter reflects back to me this message. You are changed by what has happened, what is happening. So do not seek the future in the tomb of the past. And it's stunning and awesome as I fall into Easter this year, guided to live into a future with new love and new hope. Guided to live into a future with new life and renewed love yet to come. Falling into Easter, I am caught and held by a new hope, a path forward, and the possibility that this new creation, it has a place for me to join in, take action, and create the good. Oh
Easter is a myth which helps us reflect on what collective liberation requires of us. The original writer or writers of the gospel according to Mark were some of the first to realize that Jesus wasn't coming back soon. So they thought they'd better get this story that they'd been telling written down so they could pass it on. And around the time that the, the gospel we heard Jamili tell from earlier was compiled, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed for the last time, although they didn't know it, then forcing the followers of Rabbi Jesus's message to shift their attention to the spiritual task of love of neighbor rather than the worldly place of their ancestral devotion. And in between this time when Markan writers recorded their accounts and when the Gospels were eventually canonized, a new ending to the mythology of Easter emerged. And so some other authors, not Markin, added on a different ending to the gospel according to Mark to fit this emerging theology. There was no concept of copyright in those biblical compilation days. And so the Mark and telling of Easter is neither a historical account nor a systematic theology, but a myth in progress. A draft, if you will, of a myth which tried to capture what had been shared orally in the decades and centuries after Jesus lived and died. So where are we in the mythology of Easter right now? Some of us feel like we are at the end, we're vaccinated, we're liberated, we're free, but your individual salvation salvations are actually just in the middle of this myth. Before Jesus rises from the tomb, before Jesus is murdered by the state, before Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, having given his last message to the masses, the individual salvations come in the middle of the story when people meet Jesus, when people are healed by Jesus, when people are compelled by this message, when they hear the liberatory message of a love without prescription and are saved by that healing balm. The communal liberation, the shared liberation, will not come for a while after that. And it won't come for a while now. After all, less than 20% of our country and our state is fully vaccinated. Just under 30% of the country is at least partially vaccinated. There is no vaccine approved yet for the youngest among us. None of the youngest among us, none of the children are safer yet, even in small gatherings. Best case scenario, they say we reach herd immunity between, for adults, somewhere between May and July. But that's just for the initial strains of SARS-CoV-19 as far as we know right now. 
And there may be more unknowns not apparent to us yet. We are in the middle of the myth, even if you feel like you've been saved. Our Easter moment has not yet come. We haven't made the trek to the tomb with the women, with the funeral oils and cloths in hand. We are still waiting for the liberation to be communal, shared, fully realized. And really, the vaccine was never the thing that was going to save us. The monumental spiritual task of this pandemic has been to learn that only we can save us. As my colleague, Reverend Teresa Soto wrote, all of us need all of us to make it. And when I say save to Unitarian Universalists, I'm not necessarily talking about being saved in heaven by God. I'm talking about the universal salvation that our ancestors dreamed up the type of saving that happens here on earth when we are in relationship with each other and believe in our bones that capital L love extends fully to all, no exceptions or discrimination. I believe that we can save each other here and now on this earth in our communities and this is the spiritual salvation that will bring our Easter moment. We save each other when we wear masks during COVID season and flu season and when someone, someone in our proximity is otherwise sick. We save each other when we base our relations in a radically honest consent, sharing openly and freely what risks we have taken and what we need from one another. We save each other when we engage in mutual aid, believing that all can share and all can need and that all of us need all of us to make it. We save each other when we extend church beyond our physical walls and bring the healing message of Unitarian Universalism into the places where we live and work and play. This is how we save each other. This is how we achieve, get closer to collective liberation. Yes, medicine will help us get back together in person faster, but no medicine can create beloved community. We, with our message of love without limitations, without discrimination, we save each other when we share this message. We started our service today with this prayer from Reverend David O. Rankin. We are tired of crying. We are tired of burying. We are tired of mourning. But Easter is here, will be here. And we who have survived are prepared. We are ready for joy. We are ready for love. We are ready for new beginnings. I am ready. I bet you are ready. And we are in a middle place still, in between grief of the past and the collective liberation that could be our future, if we can make it so. So I'll draw on those words that Reverend Matthew said to us earlier in this service. You are changed by what has happened, what is happening. So do not seek the future in the tomb of the past. Falling into Easter, we are caught and held by new hope, a path forward, and the possibility that this creation has a place for us to join in, take action, and create good. May we remember in this middle space to continue reaching for that collective liberation. 
our Easter moment. These words of chalice extinguishing come from Richard Gilbert. In the holy quiet of this promising hour of spring, may we purge ourselves of coldness of spirit that warm spring breezes may thaw our souls. May the debris of wrongs unforgiven be gathered and discarded so that we can begin anew. May the slowness of spirit, frozen by cold, be quickened to every fresh possibility. May the song that has lingered too long in our lungs be inspired by the never-ending bird choruses. May the grim grime of mistakes be rinsed from our minds with the springtime waters of self-forgiveness. May the dust of exhausting journey be wiped from the furniture of our lives so that it gleams again. May we muster the strength to do our own spring house cleaning of the spirit. Mm -hmm.